All right, it's one o'clock. Uh, people will probably file in from lunch, but we might as well get started. There's a lot to talk about. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, and everyone can see. So this is Drupal 8 routing. Um, my name is Tim Plunkett. I'm a developer at Stanford University Graduate School of Business and a core subsystem maintainer, uh, mostly with uh, views and core in Drupal 8. But I uh, wanted to talk today about the new routing system for Drupal 8. So first, show of hands, who has never written hook menu in a module before? Anyone? Okay. I'm skipping all of that, so I'm assuming you all know that. So that was uh, only like two or three people raised their hands. Hopefully you'll catch up as we go. Um, who here has yet to use, or who has started already using Drupal 8 and looking at it? So about half the room, okay. Uh, first things first, hook menu did too much. I don't think anyone will argue with that. Um, it was responsible for routing, uh, menu links, local actions, local tasks, breadcrumbs, contextual links, and even the overall menu hierarchy, um, which is not necessarily a function, it was just a kind of a hidden feature that you got. But uh, that's you know six different things, one hook, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. Hook menu is dead in Drupal 8, or will be shortly. Um, there are a couple things in this presentation that have not yet happened, uh, but they will this week, and I will point them out uh, which ones haven't happened yet. But already, just like an hour ago, the breadcrumbs are now completely path-based. We'll get into that later on. So routing. A route is just a map from a URL to a controller. Here's an example of a D7 hook menu. This is borrowed from the pants module, which is a nice example module. So you have uh, the path, admin config people pants. Then you have a title, pants. The description is to administer pants. Page callback, Drupal get form. Page arguments is a string pants setting. That will be the function name that is called. Uh, the access arguments are just administer pants. And it, this callback happens to be located in a separate file. So this is all familiar to everyone, yes? Great, okay. This is the Drupal 8 version of hook menu. I said hook menu is about to die, it's about to die. Uh, right now, if you're working on porting your modules, you'll need this for any visible menu links, but the only thing that really remains are the title and description. Uh, you'll notice we have a route name here, and it's just pants.settings. It's a machine name and you can choose it. It's not magically named at all. So this is the pants routing YAML. This is the part that takes over the routing aspect of hook menu from Drupal 7. So there's the machine name again. You have pants settings and the path. So the path is the same thing that you used to put in the items, the, the key in the array of the menu items. And then there's two other sections, defaults and requirements. Um, you'll see that this is exactly the same as uh, they are here, just the, instead of uh, access arguments, administer pants, we have permission, administer pants as a requirement. Uh, and the title is also here. The new thing is this form, Drupal pants form, pants settings form. So that's all PSR zero and um, names, PHP 5.3 namespaces. I'm not covering that, but the point is that this is the form that we want to be used as this uh, instead of the old page callback. So here's the D7 version of the page callback. It was just a settings form. It determined what type of pants, and in this case, it has no, no pants options. So you can see we have a, just a regular form API, and then this magical system settings form. So here's the Drupal 8 version. This is the, what we call route controller. And uh, I'll cover a bunch of some of this stuff more in depth later, but we have this, it's a form, and it has a build form method, and we're doing the same thing. We have form API all the way down. And then we have build parent build form. That's just you know, a proper object or in where the parent class config form base uh, provides most of the magic that system settings form used to do. There's a couple other parts of the form base that I've cut out from this because I'll talk about it later. So don't just copy and paste this and hope it works. But that's the, the general idea is instead of a single function in a file, you have a method on a class. 
So menu links, we talked, routing was the first part. The second part of hook menu were the menu links. This is the part that's not done yet. Um, there's a patch to do it and it's in the process. But these are the ones that are physically visible on your site. Um, so the new way to do them will be called hook default menu links. And it will just be uh, what route name it's for, the title of the description, and you specifically have to tell it which its parent is. So before, if you were defining menu links, it just, if you had, you know, uh, admin config uh, de development, and you had admin config development testing, um, those, t that would be the child of it, just magically based on the path structure. Now you can have links be the children of anything just based on its parent, and it's not restricted to the path. Um, this will let you kind of build better menus uh, where you can just pull something in, you can give it the URL you want, not the URL that you need it to be with an extra slash at the end. Um, so if you want more information on it, that's the issue, and it should probably go in maybe this weekend. Local actions. Local actions are the buttons at the top of the page. They look like that. That's Drupal 7. And that's Drupal 8. So a no local action, it used to be in hook menu, and now it's in a YAML file. Um, like, a lot of our code is in YAML files now, including the info files and the routing files and the local actions files and the local task files and the contextual links files and the config files and the config schema files. So there's a lot of YAML. Uh, thankfully, it's really easy to write. It's white space sensitive, it takes keys and values, and that's it. Um, so you'll see, just as, just as simple, the, this is actually the, uh, exact one I was just showing you, the add content type, and it's, takes, it appears on the node overview types route, and it has a title of add content type, and the route name where it links to is the node type add, to add a new content type. So you'll have just a, a file full of these just by themselves, and th then you can keep all of that, uh, those little buttons, separate from the actual routes themselves, and you just reference them. The other nice thing is, in Drupal 7 and before, this, uh, you, you could only kind of put that on one place. You had this, this button can only appear on this page. Now, this, you'll see, appears on is an array. You can just list as many routes as you want here, and that button will show up on all those pages. Local tasks, they're kind of very, very similar in code to local actions, but they're completely different um, in implementation and use case. These are the ones that are sort of related tasks, um, not necessarily a new thing. So those are the local tasks on the views page for views settings. So you have like list, you have settings, basic, advanced. Um, these, this is the definition of them. It gets a little small at the bottom of the slide, but uh, you just have a machine name, completely arbitrary, the route name, that it links to, and the title. And then each of these has a root ID. You'll see that these all have, these two have the same root ID, that's the list and settings, and these two have the same, uh, or sorry, parent ID, which is the, uh, the other one. So they're all, all four of those are grouped together. But uh, using the different, the parents and the roots, this code might change a little bit in terms of the naming. Uh, we just, it's, this is matches exactly what was in menu.inc in Drupal 7, but as we all know, menu ink is pretty confusing. So there's work to, to rename those keys, but it, the idea is that it will keep it separate from all your actions and all your other things, and you can just have a file of all your local tasks. Contextual links. Those are the little, you know, you can see them, they pop up generally on a, an entity. We don't really use them anywhere else, but you can put them on anything. And they're the little helpers for that little piece of uh, of content or that, uh, that block or menu and whatnot. And those are also going to be defined in YAML. This is also not yet in core, but it will be very, very soon. And it's exactly the same. You have a route name, which is just a machine name, and then you have the title, and these are grouped um, so that you can have them you know, in, in a specific order. And all of these support weights. Actually, I think I had, yeah, way down at the bottom of this, it says weight 10. They all have weights. So you can, you can, the order of the YAML file is not necessarily important. If you want, you can list them in any order or any grouping and just change the weights. Okay, breadcrumbs. This is the thing that just went in today. So breadcrumbs are a huge problem for most people. I don't know of anyone that actually really 
uses the breadcrumbs that are provided by default in core. There's about a dozen plus different decent breadcrumb modules in Contrib, and all of them do very, very different things, but they all do them in very different ways, and some of them are actually huge performance problems, um, and they're not very well written. So the one nice thing in Drupal 8 is that we have a uh, consistent API for how you change breadcrumbs on a page. For anyone that doesn't know, that's what breadcrumbs are, these right here. So here's an example of how the, the new breadcrumbs code would look. So you start off, you have a breadcrumb builder interface. A uh, breadcrumb builder is, you know, you provide a separate builder and you can have many builders running at one time and each one kind of claims, you know, that, that path. So this one, if you don't have any new fancy route stuff, you're still porting old code, this one will run and it will just call Drupal set breadcrumb if array return. So this is an example, but the, the idea is you just get an array of attributes, you do whatever you need to do and you return an array. So there's about four or five of these in core. So forum module, uh, comment module, book module, those all provide uh, custom breadcrumbs. So instead of just on every single page, they want to change the breadcrumb, they have to repeat that code over and over again or put it in a helper function. Uh, you just register it completely separately and tell it which pages to run on. So here's an example of comment breadcrumbs. Um, here you have, you say, oh, if this is the comment reply route, this works on these, these routes. So then anytime it's on a comment reply, you, you find the node, it, and then you link, you, the first thing is home, and then you have a link to the node. Um, normally on a comment page, it would just be the comment name, but you, you want it to be the node it's from. So anyone can provide breadcrumbs with this new breadcrumb builder interface, um, and it, it'll, it's, it's, it'll kind of uh, unify the ones that are in contrib. And the other thing is, my favorite breadcrumb module was uh, breadcrumbs by path, which is if you build out your URL structure, it just takes the title from each page before it, and you have this nice breadcrumb that matches your URL, and that's actually in core now. So the default implementation of breadcrumbs is to look at each path and find the title um, instead of just working off the magic menu structure. Okay, so that was just a blow through really, really, really quickly of the six different things. I'm gonna talk a little bit about advanced routing. So the first thing is these defaults. So I, in the example I just showed you, this one just says underscore form. Um, that means it's a form. It has a class name after it, and it just loads that class and calls the build form method on it. So these are the other main examples of the different kinds of things you can use. So for example, we have controller. A controller is when you're actually returning a full response. So for example, uh, you're returning some JSON or you're re redirecting to another page. Um, you are completely in control of every single piece of output on that page. And before, if you wanted to return some JSON, you had to like print Drupal JSON in code, Drupal add footer and then exit or die just to make sure that the theme didn't uh, print, print out the entire you know, page and breadcrumbs and menus and everything. This is saying, you know, Drupal, don't put anything else on my page. Every, everything I'm returning you is everything that should go. Um, content is the opposite of that. That is saying, I'm putting something in the main content region. Please do all of the other things. Uh, there's a couple other very specific ones that are for entities. So in Drupal 8, everything is an entity. Uh, I mean almost everything. Everything that's not an entity, we just didn't get done in time. Everything's an entity. So we have three different routing defaults that are intended for the entities. So for example, the node edit form. You have this entity form, and you say entity form, the entity type, and then the operation you were performing. And this will automatically build you the entire entity form that you needed. Same thing with lists. We have these lists of content. So uh, you can list your content types or you can list the nodes, which generally done with a view, but if you're not using views, you can, uh, you can provide an entity list. And you just say entity list and then your entity type. Uh, and the same thing for like the node view page. You say, I'm going to view the node. And that's, it's the view mode that you can put in here. So this could have been teaser or if you're using any custom view modes, you can put them in there. Oops. So routing parameters. So before in Drupal 7, you sometimes had the little percent node 
Um, and that man meant that you magically called the node underscore load function, and that would give you your node back. Um, and you could write those for anything. But we found out that 99% of every single loader was for an entity type. So this will magically match. If this, it'll look for this curly brace, and anything in here, if that's the name of an entity type, it'll try to load it. So for example, you go to this page, and it's the manager content type page. So if this says the string article, it will load the entire article node type object. Um, so that can get kind of tricky, and there's other ways to add your own upcasters, uh, which is what they're called. They, they take this placeholder and the value you provide and turn it into something else, generally an object. Um, but for everything that you're doing with entity types uh, and entities, this will just work automatically. So there's also the ability to pass a default parameter. So if you have something, like this just says admin structure types, but it, there's nothing in that path that says it's for nodes or node types. So we have this generic entity list controller class that says I will list anything. And you have to tell it what entity type to use. So we can just say entity type. And you'll see here, this entity type, the actual parameter name, has to match exactly to the machine name you give here. So it's going to call it the Drupal core entity controller, entity list controller, with the listing method with node type passed into entity type. And it ends up here, you have the entity list controller, the listing method, and it passes through entity type. So if you can provide uh, any arguments you want to your routes, even if they're not in the URL. Um, when you pass them like they're in the URL, that is the equivalent of an optional parameter. So this is the views, uh, the views edit form. Normally when you go to a view edit form, it loads like the default display or the page display. But then when you click to the different displays, you have like, it'll be like slash block, slash feed. But it's optional. So this display ID here at the end is completely optional. So we say display ID equals null. That, that way, it doesn't require anything. Um, while this view is obviously required. So that would be the, the machine name of the view, it gets turned into an object, and the display ID, if it's not specified, will just be turned into null. Routing requirements, that's the bottom of the, the routing info. This is just a, a way that we, it's kind of like the access arguments in Drupal 7, but it also has a little bit more power to it. So you'll notice all these things have different underscores in front. That's like a machine, in, you know, it's, it means internal. Like, don't mess with it. Compared to this dis, oh, excuse me, display ID, which has no underscore. Um, so this underscore permission is the equivalent of calling user access. Um, so it says, okay, this, they can only get to this route if they have the permission administer pants. These are some other ac uh, examples of access checkers. So if you used to do access callback equals true, you can just say access true. For example, if you want it to be, if you used to write, oh, you have to have the access callback was a function that checked and said it's, uh, if the user was logged in, you can just say user is logged in true. And uh, this access theme, for example, was uh, used by the blocks module. So if, they, if you want to make sure that they have access to the theme that that page is for, you can just say access theme, and it'll check which theme and ensure they have access to it. You can also get a little bit more complex. So in addition to the permissions ones, we have entity access, very similar to the entity form and entity view. It's the entity type name and then the operation you were performing. So if you just put entity access node edit, they have to have the ability to edit that node. That will check you know, all of the different things, like the permissions, and if they're UID one, and if they're the owner of the node. All that logic is kept elsewhere still, and you just tell it which entity type and which operation. Um, when it comes to creating, that implies, you know, entity access implies you have an entity and you want to access it. When it doesn't exist yet, like if you're checking access for the create form, you use a separate entity create access. And this one is even more complex. It says that we're creating a taxonomy term, but also check and see which vocabulary was in the path so it knows which vocabulary to create that term for. So you can, you can add some very complex access checkers um, that inspect the path um, and, and, do, and perform logic on it. Also at the bottom you'll see access mode, any. So as of right now, this moment, it, that's the default, but it's being switched to access, check, access mode all. 
And that way that if you list multiple access checkers, they're all anded together. So they have to pass all requirements. If you wanted to say they only get to this page if they can administer nodes or if they can edit that node, you will have to specify any. Um, and that was another thing that we didn't have in Drupal 7, where if you wanted to combine two or three different types of access, you had to write a separate callback and then check them individually. Now you're able to just stack them in a row and you don't have to write any custom code. All of these are provided for you. The other cool thing is you can do uh, regular expressions on these and with no extra work. So for here, when you're on the views UI and you're enabling, enabling or disabling a, a view, there's an op. We only allow enable and disable. There's no other operations to perform. But we didn't want to have to define this whole route twice. So we said the only valid values for op are enable or disable. And that's just regular, regular expressions. Um, same thing with user view. It ensures that uh, to prevent it from clashing with like user login uh, or user lock out, we say user slash something has to be a number. So that's a regular expression for a number. These are not subject to the any all rules. These are applied first. So if it doesn't match the regex, then nothing else will happen. Uh, but you can get really creative with those, uh, and they're very, very powerful. So, whew. controller. So I've used the word controller a couple times. That's just the callable that we're using instead of what we used to call a callback. Um, you, Symfony allows for many different ways to use controllers, but everything in Drupal 8 now is a method, and it's a instance method, it's not a static method, and, but it is, its responsibility is to return the full HTTP response. If you're using that underscore content, that Drupal will then take that and wrap that in a full response, but if you're using underscore controller, you have to actually return a response object. So let's put it all together here. So this is the block admin form. So if you're adding a new block, uh, it's got a machine name, and it takes two parameters, plugin ID and theme. But the theme is optional, and it's got a title. The title is configure block, and of course, it's administer blocks is the permission check. This is the actual class that's in core. So those plugin ID theme that are in the, the routes as placeholders are the exact uh, parameters of this method, plugin ID and theme. And it says, uh, and you'll notice that even though we said theme was optional, there's no equals null there because we specified null here. So it will always have a value. In Drupal 7, you would have written that differently. You just said plugin ID comma theme equals null in case it wasn't there. This ensures that there's always a value. So then it just calls out to the entity manager and creates a new block and then presents the form for it. So this is the, when you write a controller, you want it to be about this size. You don't want to put everything, all of your application logic into that entire method. You'll see this delegates to two different things, the storage controller and directly to the entity manager. It first creates the block and then gets the form. In Drupal 7, this code would actually create the new block object as a standard class and then have the form code in line. This way, everything's kept separate. It's very, very clear what this, this method does. It just creates and then hands off to the form. So you should strive to keep your controllers uh, thin, as they call them. You also notice here controller base. So controller base is completely optional. There's just a lot of helper methods inside of it. So this is the controller base. It gives you the entity manager, quick access to cache, the config for configuration management, the module handler to check, is it uh, installed, you know, what invoke hooks and alter hooks, L for links, the current user, instead of using global user, all controllers can just ask what's the current user, and you don't have to worry about global user anymore. Uh, the T uh, method, which replaces the T function, and then a quick way for doing redirects and URLs. I know when the, there used to be Drupal go to, right? Everyone remembers Drupal go to, and it did about 27 things based on what you passed into it. Um, and most of the time you just use it for a simple redirect. But then they replaced it with all these different methods. And I remember when the change notice was posted, everyone on Twitter went crazy and said, oh my gosh, I have to write 20 lines of code because I can't call it Drupal go to anymore. But we just provide a method that is the 90% use case of it, and now you don't have to look inside there at all. You just tell it what route to redirect to, and you're done. 
Um, and same with URL, it was the same thing. We used to have this little URL function. Uh, it, it is now an entire URL generator that can handle the internal, the external, and uh, path-based and route-based. And all we have here is just URL that takes the 90% use case and puts it in this controller. So the, the controller base class. So this is just very useful for you to uh, cut down the boilerplate of your controllers and just call the things you need to do. So these are just some example form classes. I said earlier we used to have system settings form. There's now a config form base. Uh, confirm form went the same route. There's no more confirm form. It's now a confirm form base that does all the things where it has, it asks you what you want to do and it presents you with a button and a backlink and all that stuff is in a, in a base form that you just extend and don't have to worry about. Um, and then each of the individual previous page callbacks like node form, user profile form, user login are now all classes in their namespace. So you have node form, profile form, and user login form. Form interface is what guides all of these. You saw when you had the beginning that content and controller took a class name and a method name, but yeah, form just takes a class name. That works because there's a single form interface that every single form will use. Um, Plug-in forms, block forms, entity forms, your own one-off forms, everything will have to use this. Um, I remember when I first started using Drupal, uh, it, I had no idea how validate and submit worked. Some of them it seemed like it was magic. Some of them specified them in the method, in the function, and some of them did both. Um, instead of that, you just have this interface that reminds you, these are the things you need to do. Get form ID is only because it used to be that the function name would become your form ID. And because PHP will only allow one function of one name, it was magically enforced to be unique. Now you actually have to specify your form ID, um, but you can then create what, uh, make it whatever you'd like. And you can even include logic in your get form ID method. Um, and then build form is the old, you know, the actual used to be the function, and then validate form and submit form are the uh, methods that replace those old magical callbacks. Um, but the nice thing is when you set up your form, you can have all your dependencies and then your build form, you can store things as instance variables uh, or properties and access them later and all your code that kind of used to be just spread over three or four functions all becomes one nice cohesive class. Um, and if you have multiple buttons that have multiple submit handlers, you can just add other methods here and specify them. So you don't have to, if you have you know, a, a form with maybe three buttons on it like there are in core, Instead of it being six functions, you can have just one class with six methods. So that was the end of my whirlwind tour of routing. I have to put this up here to remind you all to come out and hang out tomorrow. Um, I'm going to now start taking questions and showing off other things, and I can go back to anything I talked about. So is there someone with a mic or a mic thing? Eh, OK. Shout, and I'll repeat your question. Pants namespace. Oh, the um, P yeah, the PHP namespace stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the question was, some people are saying that your modules shouldn't be in the Drupal namespace, and other people are saying it should be. Um, and what do we, what's enforced, what's the rule? So the rule is they have to. If your stuff is in the Drupal namespace, it's not a real module. We have, no one's tried that otherwise. Um, the people who say it probably shouldn't be in the namespace are right, but that's not how the Drupal ecosystem works yet. Um, we're not there. And that gets into whole sorts of like um, using Composer, oh, sorry, using Composer in interesting ways um, and kind of revamping how modules coexist with each other. But right now, no, everything has to be in the Drupal namespace. It's just, that's how it works, in the middle. Right, so I think I had that on a slide, but I didn't talk about it. There is a, uh, da, da, da. nope. Hmm. Ah, yeah, I didn't talk about it. I did put it on the slide in case someone asked. So before you had title, title's easy, it's static. You know, you have title callback. Um, so all it is here is another one of those underscored uh, things in your defaults, and you list out the method that's called. 90% of the time, that's gonna be a method on the same class, but it allows you to reuse other ones. 
So for example, like the entity page label, the generic one, you can, you can specify that. Right, so I didn't get into that because A, it's crazy right now and we need to fix it. And I didn't wanna do a whole bunch of slides on something that's terribly, terribly confusing. That, so the question was, uh, what about gen dynamically generated routes? So in your hook menu, you used to have a, uh, a for each loop or conditional logic and stuff. And there's other ways to, to do that. It's called a route subscriber, but they're insanely verbose right now. And we've just been kind of chugging along and there were only one or two and they were in like modules like views UI. So it wasn't a big deal. But now that we realize that like most of contrib and custom modules will need that functionality, we need to revisit it and um, come up with a better way to make it easier for you to do that. Because it's, I mean, I can, sh I can show code. Um, it's basically you have, uh, well in Symfony there's this whole concept of events instead of hooks, and you subscribe to an event and it says, okay, now build me all your routes. And you actually have to uh, build them in the, like, as PHP objects and return them. So I can show one. Wow, that's big. I can make that a little smaller, I think. Uh. Can anyone still see that? Yes, okay, great. So, block. Wow, that's really big still. Okay, so, yeah, this is a, that's a bad example. I'll use field UI. So the field UI has a bunch, they, you know, you have all the different, every entity type has its own page with those like manage fields, manage display. So this is just a, a class called event subscriber interface. We call it a route subscriber. And it has a method that you get this event. You can get the existing routes from it. And then this just loops through all the entity types. And it's the same thing as the YAML, except in parameters to this object. So you just create new route objects and pass them through. Um, so this is the same thing where here's the path, here's the defaults, here's the requirements. Um, except it's, as I said, like setting this up is really complex. Every time I do it, I do it wrong. And I've done like three of these already. So we need to, and I helped write it, and I, can do, I do it wrong. So we need to come up with a better way, which is why I kind of skipped, glossed over it. There are this, the six or seven examples in core but those are hopefully liable to change. Um, that's something I wanna work on this weekend. So I hope that answered your question. Okay, anyone else? Next, uh, yep. So where do, okay, that was really good. Cool. Where do controllers get their dependencies from? Um, like services and stuff. So, that's a very good question. There, are, there is a special interface the container called container injection interface. And if you're a controller and you'd like to have, so, so okay, for everyone who doesn't know what services are, I'm sorry. Um, you should have gone to Larry's session. Uh, but there's these global helpful objects, basically, classes uh, that you might want, like the caching uh, factory or the entity manager. Um, and you would very often want those in your in your classes. And that's what actually the uh, controller base was when I was saying, oh, controller base has all these helpful methods. That's just getting those services for you. So if you need other dependencies, you can implement this container injection interface um, and it will, when creating your form, let you pass things to your form. So there's a, I mean, there's like 150 examples of that in core. So if you need, other services, and you should. I mean, you should be handing off your services. You shouldn't be querying the database directly in your controller. You should be asking a, like an, a manager or something, or a repository, what to look for. Um, you can use this interface to, to get those injected. Follow up. Right, so the question was, would it be better if forms, or controllers in general, sorry, uh, were services themselves? And yes, you can use service names instead of class method in those YAML files. So when we first, the very first module to use routes in Drupal 8 was views UI. We decided to pick the hardest one first, just to see if it worked. Um, and when we wrote it all, every single one was a service. But that meant 
I mean, already you have to, just like you did in Drupal 7, you have to declare it in hook menu and then write your callback. In Drupal 8, you have to put it in routing YAML and then write your callback. To do it as a service, you have to declare it as a service, declare it in routing YAML, and write the callback. Um, and the other thing is that then you have this kind of, what's it mean? Um, you have all of your useful services that are actually like stateless, helpful objects mushed in with all of your controllers, which are one-off and thin and, and whatnot. So it was polluting all of our services, so we chose not to do that. Um, if you had some very, very, very useful one that you wanted to do, you can. And you can do whatever you want in contrib and custom code. So you can do that. It's just it, we decided it was too verbose and there was no real gain. Okay, next question. Seriously? Okay. Um, oh, yes, in the way back. Sorry, is it load keys? What keys are allowed in the YAML files? So yeah, um, the what keys? So these the path defaults options requirements. Those four keys are straight from Symfony. So the Symfony documentation has uh, you know ex explains all of those. And each of the underscore ones in here are um, our intern. They they map to our code, but they follow the Symfony patterns. Um, so each of these like access mode and access theme and permission. Um, if you, you know, if you grep for them, you'll find the class that defines them, that, def that explains what they do. But the uh, path defaults options requirement stuff is straight vanilla symphony and can be found either like, I mean, there's plenty of documentation online, but they actually, I think, nope, that's the wrong class. So it's in the constructor of the route object, path defaults requirements options. So, and you can actually also do like other things like hosts and schemes and stuff, like for, uh, you know, other stuff. But those, those these are d documented there and, and there's really good, Symphony has actually really great documentation, so. Okay, all right, next question. Yep, down here. Yes. So inform-based controller validation is required. The method is required, um, and there's actually, I didn't even mention this, so just like there's controller base and we had form interface, there's a form base. And it gets a lot of those other, the same methods, um, and it also just puts an empty validate form, so it says validation is op optional, so that way you don't have to do it. I mean, you can just leave it, you could do that in Drupal 7, you could implement the validate callback and do nothing. It doesn't matter unless you've set an error or something. So um, yeah, so this is there, so you don't have to have that in every class, but almost every other form has a, you know, has a build form, obviously, and 99.9% .9 of them have a submit form. So, okay, there was another one, another question? Someone's pointing, yes, okay, you again. <laughs> So the question was, you still use form set error. No one has pointed that out yet, that we're still doing that. Um, there's a couple, I mean, we, the, the, obviously the goal has been to remove as many procedural function calls from inside your classes as possible, but the main, one of the main reasons to do that is for unit testing. And if you want to unit test form API, that's your problem. Um, until we rewrite form API as you know object-based, um, we're not really, looking to do that. So most of your forms are obviously still gonna be uh, tested with some, a web test of some sort. Larry. Right, do we use any of those yet, actually? Not really. So. Not really, okay. Um, yeah, so there is the ability to use different MIME types uh, and specify them. I don't know offhand where we actually even do that, although I do know, sorry. Oh, sorry, the question was, uh, as you can actually see from this route class, um, in addition to those other things, we now have the ability to, oh, that's not it, uh, s specify like the URI scheme or the HTTP method that was used so that it'll um, one can be used for J 
JSON and one can be used for HTML. Um, and that way, you, you, you can reuse the same path uh, in multiple different ways. And I didn't put it together any slides on that because there was a rest session this week. So, um, but it is very possible and it's very very cool. Um, I was mostly showing off the stuff that you could do in Drupal 7 as well, but uh, there is a lot more that you can do now. Okay. Yes. Again. Yes. Okay, so the question was in Drupal 7, the menu hierarchy was just determined from the paths themselves and from your hook menu. And now you have to explicitly specify a parent. And you're saying you don't, didn't really care in most cases. So, right, so the, the thing is, we, there's a lot of magic in that. Um, and if your paths change, or if you want something to be in that hierarchy, it's really hard to get it in there, and there was always a lot of hacks to, to set, like especially with menu set active breadcrumb in the callback itself to trick it into thinking it was in that menu. Um, now it's you can being able to specify explicitly and forcing you to, to set the parent um, will make it faster to compute the hierarchy um, and make it easier to figure out what's actually going on, and will make it easier to do things that aren't strictly based on your path. So it's considered a feature, not a hint, not like a, we didn't do it on purpose to make your life worse. I'm sorry. Yep. So to sum that up, he doesn't like any of this. Um, <laughs> uh, so your, your point is that yeah, hook menu doing too many things was a, was a good thing, and it made your life easier, and it was easier to write, and it was the job of menu.inc to figure it all out at the end. Um, and that's true until you actually try to do something a little bit more complex. Like, has anyone tried to set up default tab and local task with a view um, and done it right the first time? Good, because that's not possible. Uh, it's like undoable. So it's very, very, very complex to do, especially with the uh, relationship between default local tasks, the path itself, and the local task to get that right the first time. Um, and I think maybe local action is a good example of where it was nice to do. But the, the idea is that this local action has nothing to do with your route. And we have these route machine names now that we didn't have before. Everything was keyed based on the actual system path. Now that there's machine names, um, you, you can swap out what path it's on and it'll just continue to work. So let's say I want to move node add to content add. I don't need to use any aliasing, aliasing or anything. I can just say the node add machine name route is now pointing to this path. All the local actions, all the local tasks, everything will show up exactly as it was before with a completely different URL because everything's built around this machine name. Um, so it allows a lot more flexibility to do things you couldn't do. If you continue to build your sites exactly as you did before, this will probably seem verbose. But the idea is that it'll, it, it's easier to understand t when you're trying to debug something harder, um, and it gives you a lot more flexibility that you just did not have before. Uh, blue, yeah. I can't, I'm sorry, can you start over? Yes, so in Symfony you can take an entire set of routes and replace other ones or add them in. And so that's exactly what Views does. Um, so for example, when you, if you install Drupal 8 with just the minimal install without Views, you still have an admin content page and an admin people page. And that's on a specific route. And then when you enable Views, we have those Views there that replace them. 
they're not, well, <laughs> in core, they're doing it wrong. But the idea is that they will actually then directly replace those routes, um, and you can add on a set. It's just like we have info hooks and we have alter hooks. Those route subscribers, there's a, there's a dynamic event, it's like the, the info event, and there's an alter event. So you have two passes at it. In addition to defining static ones, um, there's two separate events to let you change things and add entire sets based on other ones and introspect that. Okay. There was another question next to him. Right, so yeah, the, those route subscribers with the dynamic events, um, you, you, as I said, you have two, two passes at it to get everything you want down here. Why are we doing it? Um, because we didn't really think about it. And then right now, I think if you, sorry, oh, the question was why are we doing it wrong in core? And it's because we didn't know any better. Uh, now we found out we were doing it wrong, so we're fixing it. Um, okay, yeah? Is there a way to have a menu that skips the bootstrap? Um, Um, no, there's no way to specify the bootstrap level of, as far as I know, anything. You can't decide that for yourself, unless you're writing completely external Drupal code. So unless you are manually doing the bootstrapping from outside Drupal, you can't control when the bootstrap stops. You, you get it or you don't. And menu links, I mean, menu links are in the UI. They're super not vital to an application level. So you can have routes and without menu links at all. Um, and you, we could reuse Drupal routes outside of Drupal context, but no, there's absolutely, there's no way to do that. So what he was saying was that as we've progressed throughout Drupal 8, we've tightened up Bootstrap, made there be less Bootstrap levels, less things need to be done in order to have Drupal run. Um, and should I even repeat the other thing you said is a bad idea? You can actually listen at the request level before Drupal even gets to it and kind of in intercept it and prevent the rest of Drupal from working, which is cool, but probably not a normal thing to do. Yeah. We didn't tell you about it, so. All right, anything else? Yes, I'm here. Okay, so the question was, we've just finished replacing a hook with about six different things, and is it, will we see more events instead? So the one thing I think is a shame in Drupal 8 is that we won't have enough events. There are very, very, very few events, and I think most of our events are actually fired from Symfony code anyway. Like this routing thing is not, we're not dispatching that event, it's just happening. There was a lot of talk of actually replacing all hooks with an event that happened to call the hook for you. So no more module implements, or, or module invoke all. Um, that just didn't happen. And the, I don't think there's enough hook, uh, events in core, and we might wanna add a couple extra just as an example so that people do it right and contrib. But uh, I think a lot more of those will be events by Drupal 9 for sure. Um, events are really cool, and they, I don't necessarily think they're any better or worse than hooks. Um, we did kill a ton of info hooks, but those weren't even hooks anyway. They were just a way of declaring data. So, but the true, the true hooks that are reacting to events um, they're still there for the most part. In terms of, I don't, no one has really benchmarked it as far as I know. I mean, there was the benchmarks of the implementation of backwards compatibility having both at the same time for every hook, and that was bad. Um, I don't think anyone actually benchmarked ripping them out, just because it would be way too much work to do in core. Um, and I mean, hooks are like our thing, so we weren't ready to just rip off the Band-Aid. Yes. Yes. There, so the question was, is there any way to do multilingual paths? The answer is yes, uh, they do that. I couldn't tell you offhand how, um, but I know they do. There's the, well, the same thing where you can have 
um, domain or path prefix or query string, and all of those still work. And um, so yeah, I, th I mean, I don't know at what level they, they do that, but it's definitely, there's enough places to interrupt this flow that you can do almost anything. As Carl said, there's a request listener. You can beat Drupal to the request and do whatever you want. So, I mean, obviously you can do anything. But yeah, the, the, loc the translation stuff is working. So they must have done it somehow. And that's the nice thing is there are a lot of complex use cases already using this code. So there's a good chance that your contrib module is not more complex than the entire translation system and views UI. So there's a, there's a lot of code to learn from if you hit a problem. Okay. All right, then that's gonna be it for me. Thank you very much for everything.